you will, open up in your copy of God's Word to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, we're going to be in verses 1 through 6 today. As we've been seeing towards the end of chapter 4, Paul has, um, has kind of embarked on this journey of freedom, gospel freedom, explaining what it is, how we have it, and uh, what it means in our lives, the change that it makes in our life. And, and so as we continue into chapter 5, this theme of freedom rings out, gospel freedom. And this morning we will see this gospel freedom is a call to stand firm, a call to stand firm. Galatians, this book, is the Magna Carta of Christian liberty. I didn't come up with that on my own. Many through the ages have called it that, the Magna Carta of Christian liberty. One man who would hang his hat on this statement was a man by the name of Martin Luther. Luther knew all too well the life of bondage that comes along with trying to earn a right standing with God. Luther was born in the latter part of the 1400s, and he was born under the shadow of the Roman Catholic Church, which revolved around a works-based salvation. And later, Luther, who was so intrigued by things of God, he became a monk, and he spent years meticulously trying to do everything right so that God would love him and so that God would one day accept him when he stood before God on that final judgment day. Now, you say, well, didn't he believe in Jesus? Absolutely. Yes, Martin Luther believed in Jesus, but he didn't believe that Jesus was enough, nor did any who held to the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. And this lifestyle of trying his hardest to do everything right so that God would love him and accept him almost drove him insane. Almost drove him to a point of very deep, deep depression. Why? Because no matter how hard Martin Luther tried, in his heart of hearts, he knew that he was always falling short. On his very best day, he knew that he was falling short of the glory of God. And he knew that he could never, ever measure up to the standard of perfection that God had made. Now, as the story goes, Luther eventually came to faith in Jesus Christ. He became a Christian. He placed his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And after his salvation, Luther, for the rest of his life, fought for the true doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And he wanted people to be set free from the slavery of a works-based salvation. And Galatians, this book, was his primary text to help people understand the hopelessness of trusting in our works and to help people understand the freedom and joy of trusting in Jesus alone. For salvation. And Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, where we're going to begin today, is the pinnacle, if you will, of this book of the Bible known as the Magna Carta of Christian Liberty. In chapters 1 through 2, we could say that Paul was trying to restore trust in Paul. Not trust of salvation in Paul, but the false teachers had come in and began to discredit this guy named Paul and say, yeah, we know Paul came and talked to you Galatians, but He's not a real apostle. He doesn't preach the true gospel. So for the first two chapters, Paul spent that time saying, hey, I really am an apostle and everything I told you was true. He's a genuine preacher of freedom in Christ. And then in Galatians chapter 3, verse 4 through chapter 3 through chapter 4, verse 27, Paul was seeking to restore a scriptural understanding of justification because scripture is the foundation for freedom in Christ. And then as we've seen for the past couple of weeks, Galatians chapter 4, verse 28 through 31, Paul was trying to restore confidence in salvation. Saying something like, you are children of promise. It doesn't matter what the false teachers say. You are children of promise. 
reminding them that they are full participants of freedom in Christ. And now he's made his way to this point in the letter. It's almost like he's been climbing a mountain. He's been on this journey of climbing this mountain. He has, he has reached the top and he's fixing to take his flag and he's going to drop it in the drop it in the dirt at the top and say, "Here I am. I have said what I came to say." And as he does so in chapter 5 verses really 1 through 12, but we're just going to look at verses 1 through 6 today. After he's restored trust in himself, trust in and restored scriptural understanding of justification, restored confidence in salvation, now he wants in the lives of the believers here in the region of Galatia to restore a resilience in facing these false teachers. He wants them to be defenders of freedom in Christ. Those who are free in Christ, Paul's going to say, should live out their freedom by standing firm on salvation through faith. And therefore, they should live out their freedom by rejecting all forms of works-based salvation. Just as Martin Luther came to understand as the Spirit of God worked in his life many years ago. Let's read verses 1 through 6 together. This is God's Word. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Heavenly Father, there's no way left to ourselves we will be able to understand spiritual truths found in this passage or any place in your word. So Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be here in this place helping us understand what Paul was writing to the Galatians, helping us understand how these truths apply to our lives today. Father, help us understand your word and put it into practice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The first truth, first of three main truths that I want you to see this morning is this. Stand firm by realizing the freedom that you have in Christ. Stand firm by realizing the freedom that you have in Christ. Paul begins this chapter, this place in his letter with these incredible words, for freedom Christ has set us free. Now I want to stop right there and say, what kind of freedom is Paul referring to? Is it a political freedom here on this earth? No, it's not what he's thinking about. He's not thinking about political freedom. Is it a freedom to believe whatever I want to believe about God? Nope. It's not a freedom to believe whatever I want to believe about God. Is it a freedom to live however I want to live? No. It's not a freedom to live however we want to live. And Paul's going to talk a lot about that uh, later on in chapter 5 and then into chapter 6. It's not a freedom to live however we want to live. Well, what kind of freedom is Paul talking about? Christian freedom, as Paul is referring to here in this letter to the Galatians, is freedom from the bondage of the law as the means to salvation. That is freedom from a life of trying to be good enough, but always falling short. I, I was watching a video, some of you may have seen it, it was on the internet, it was going around, and uh, it was this, this 12-year-old boy and he was a basketball player. Nothing very interesting about that. A lot of 12-year-old boys play basketball. But there was something interesting about this 12-year-old boy. He was six foot ten, And uh, he was playing with a bunch of other boys who hadn't quite hit their growth spurt. And they're about this tall, and he's taller than I can reach. And I watched this montage of them running up and down the court, different clips from this game. I felt so sorry for all of those other kids out there. I mean, every time one of the people on the other, not, well, not the kids on his team, of course. Uh, they were probably loving it because they were winning. But the kids on the other team, every time they go to shoot the ball, I mean, he just, 
smack it right back down. He didn't have to jump. Just smack it down on their, on, on, right back in their face. They were playing on an eight-foot goal uh, just on top of that. So he was almost as tall as the basketball goal. And every single time, he just smack it right back down, smack it right back down. I thought, man, by, by the end of the first quarter, I'd be like, Coach, let's just go home, right? Let's just, this, this isn't any fun because it's a hopeless it's a hopeless endeavor to try to shoot the ball against this guy. We're, we're never going to be able to do it. We literally have fallen far short, okay? We are far too short to be of any competition to this peer. It's miserable. It's no fun. And neither is a life where we try to do something that we can't do, and that is earn our salvation. It's a life of misery. That's why God's word calls it slavery. And this is the kind of freedom that Paul is referring to when he says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Now we must remember that Jesus set us free to live in freedom, not in slavery. To live in freedom, not in slavery. We, we find this word, this, this phrase there at the end of cha- uh, verse 1, a yoke of slavery. It's the same phrase that was used at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 where Paul and Barnabas, after going on his missionary journey and they had preached the gospel of free gift of salvation that you don't have to become a Jew, you don't have to be circumcised, you don't have to follow all of the Old Testament uh, laws in order to be saved, that God will actually give you a free gift. And, and the, and the uh, Jerusalem church uh, back in Jerusalem caught wind of that. Some of the Jews didn't like that. And, and so Paul and Barnabas went there to kind of straighten things out. And after they presented their case, Paul and Barnabas and said, listen, the Holy Spirit has come upon these Gentiles these uncircumcised Gentiles, just the same that the Holy Spirit has come upon us Jews who have believed in Christ. And Peter stood up and he says, listen, brothers, listen. Why would we place upon these Gentiles a yoke of slavery that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? What is that yoke of slavery? Well, it's adherence to all of those Old Testament laws as a means for salvation. And Paul here is using that same terminology, a yoke of slavery. We must remember that Jesus set us free to live in that freedom, to not come under the yoke of the law any longer. Now, that seems obvious, right? If you think about it, and almost we almost want to read that first phrase in verse 1 and say, duh, duh, Paul. I mean, thank you, Captain Obvious, right? For freedom, Christ set us free. Well, what do you think he set us free for? For slavery? And Paul would say, well, it seems like that's what you think, Galatians, because you are following these false teachers right back into a life of slavery by beginning to think that Jesus isn't enough and somehow you have to add something to what he's done. And so he has to remind them of the obvious For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And I wonder how often our Heavenly Father has to remind us of the obvious. Why? Because throughout our lives as Christians, we face an onslaught of temptations to depend upon our works for salvation. Temptations from within us, our own pride, our own sinful tendency to depend upon ourselves. And temptations from without, from false teachers, from worldly principles, as Paul referred to in chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 9. Remember verse 9 of chapter 4, But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? The Phillips translation of the Bible Somewhat of a loose translation, but he captures the the heart of this verse uh, very clearly. He translated it, plant your feet firmly, therefore, within the freedom that Christ has won for us. And do not let yourselves be caught again in the shackles of slavery. And then Paul gives two results of this free lifestyle. One is standing firm, and the other is not submitting. The positive. Stand firm. The negative part, don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Well, let's start with the negative because I think that's where Paul starts in verse 2. 
So truth number one, truth number one, stand firm by realizing the freedom that you have in Christ. Stand firm by realizing that freedom. Understand it, enjoy it, love it, and live it out. But truth number two, how do we stand firm? Stand firm by rejecting all forms of human effort as contributing anything to your salvation. I'll say that one more time. Stand firm by rejecting all forms of human effort as contributing anything to your salvation. Now, we have to have a little, little Bible history lesson for just a minute if we're going to understand why Paul uses some of the words he uses in verses 2 through verse 4 as he talks about this not submitting. He's going to reference circumcision. Well, why does he talk about that? Well, in Jewish culture, according to God's word in the Old Testament, Jewish males were to be circumcised on the eighth day, the eighth day after they were born. And this would help set them apart from all the other people. Now, Paul is not singling this out as the only rule or the only law that the Galatians were being tempted to adhere to in order to add to their salvation. But it was representative of a works-based salvation. In fact, in fact, the Galatians, if we look at the wording that Paul uses, they haven't quite been led astray to the point of saying, hey, I need to undergo this surgery in order for God to love me. They haven't quite made it there. Because he says in verse 2, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept it, if you accept it. But they had already started down that road. Because if we went back, if we go back to chapter 4, verse 10, he says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. Not if you observe them, but you are doing that. So what's probably happened is the false teachers are slowly and gradually leading these Galatian believers down this road of submitting to the law in order to gain a right standing before God. They've already walked down this road enough that they're trying to observe all the Jewish festivals in order for God to love them. And the next step for them is circumcision. The principle applies to any work that we would trust in, any human effort that we would trust in, in order to gain us a right standing before God. It doesn't matter if that work is church attendance. It doesn't matter if that good work is reading our Bible or saying our prayers or being involved in some other way in the church or doing nice things for people. Whatever the work is, we add nothing to Jesus when we do that work. Three things, I'm going to say these fairly quickly, as we think about standing firm by rejecting all forms of human effort. When one is in verse 2, one is in verse 3, and one is in verse 4. Verse 2, look, I, Paul, say to you, to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Submitting to slavery Submitting to slavery, that is to place ourselves under a works-based salvation, means forfeiting the benefits of belonging to Jesus. You see, here's what the false teachers were coming in and saying. Yes, you need Jesus, but you also need these works. You need Jesus, and you need these works. Same thing the Roman Catholic Church was teaching. They were telling Martin Luther, yeah, you need Jesus, but you also need to do these works. And what is Paul saying? What does God's word say? If you accept any kind of works, here it was circumcision, but any kind of human effort, Christ will be of no advantage to you. In other words, if you add anything to Jesus, then you no longer have any of Jesus. He's no longer of any advantage to you. You forfeit all the benefits of belonging to Jesus. And we could go through and list all sorts of benefits that come with belonging to Jesus. I think Paul's main benefit that he is referring to here is the benefit that Jesus will provide to those who are in him on judgment day. Christ will be of no benefit, of no advantage to you when you stand before God. Here's what Paul is saying. If you stand before God one day and you say, God, you should let me into heaven 
because I have believed in Jesus and I have done all these good works so that you would love me. He will say, depart from me for I never knew you. You say, well, well, but I have Jesus too. No, no, no. It's either all of Jesus and only Jesus or none of Jesus. And so we try to add anything to what Jesus has done for us on the cross. We have forfeited any advantage that we would have in Christ. That's why one of the hallmark statements of the Protestant Reformation was salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. No additions to him. To accept any level of works as necessary for salvation is to reject all of Jesus. Second thing under this point number two, submitting to slavery means obligating yourself to an impossible standard. This is where that word slavery takes full shape and form. Submitting to, submitting to slavery means obligating yourself to an impossible standard. Look what he says in verse 3. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. He's not just simply talking about the physical act of it. He's talking about if you accept this work as a basis for God accepting you, then you then are obligated to keep the whole law. What's Paul saying? He's saying something that he's really already said. Chapter 3, verse 10. Paul said, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. The standard of the law is this, perfection. 100% keeping all of the law all of the time. All of the law, all of the time. Say that one more time. All of the law, all of the time. That's why Martin Luther was about to drive himself insane. Because he realized he couldn't live up to that standard. And Paul is reminding the Galatians, listen, you can't just pick and choose a, a law here or a rule here that you're going to obey and then God's going to accept you. If you want to walk the path of, uh, of, of being justified by the law, the only way to do it is to keep it all. James said something very similar. He said to break the law in one point means you have broken the whole law. To break the law in one point means you've broken it all. And so if we, if we begin to think that somehow good, the good works that I do make me more acceptable to God, then I am submitting myself to this path, this way of life, where I'm obligated to this impossible standard because none of us are perfect. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says that we all fall short of the glory of God. But third, under this second point, submitting to slavery also means rejecting God's grace. And this is the scariest part of it. Submitting to slavery. Remember what we mean by that. Submitting to this way of being saved by my own good works. That's what I mean by submitting to slavery. By thinking that I need to add something that I have done to what Jesus has done. It means rejecting God's grace. You, verse 4, are severed from Christ you who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Why is that so scary? Because the only way to be saved is by God's grace. And God knows that. He knows that we will always fall short of His glory. And He knows that we cannot live up to that standard of perfection. And that's why he sent his son and offered his son as payment for sin. And as Paul said in chapter 3, redemption from the curse of the law. God knows that it's only by his grace. So he has chosen to give us grace in the person and work of his son, Jesus Christ. So to rely at all on your works is to completely reject God's son. And to reject God's son is to reject God's grace. So if you are severed from Christ, you have fallen from grace. Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, Paul writes this, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died 
for no purpose. If, if Jesus' death is not enough, then Jesus' death was in vain. And if we ever say, I need to do this, this, whatever it is, in order for me to truly, for order for me to truly be saved, in order for God to really love me, then I'm saying Jesus' death on the cross was worthless. It's to reject grace, and that is to reject the only way of salvation available to humankind. So the negative side is submitting to this slavery, and Paul says, don't do it. But the positive side is, stand firm. Stand firm. How do we do that? Well, it's pretty simple. Stand firm, number three, stand firm by relying completely upon God's grace. Stand firm by relying completely upon God's grace. Now, I use that phrase, relying completely, because that's one of my favorite definitions of faith, is the word rely. Paul's going to use the word faith, and I'm going to put a couple more things up here. You're going to see, and I'm going to use the word faith, but I wanted to kind of give a definition of faith in this statement. To have faith in something is to rely upon something. The Apostle Paul, it's not much different than Martin Luther. The Apostle Paul had grown up relying upon his good works to save him. He was a faithful Jew who thought that he needed to earn God's love. He rejected the Messiah to begin with because he rejected the thought that he needed God's grace. He thought that he could somehow earn salvation. Paul has even testified to that in chapter 1. He says, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. It goes on in verse 15, it says, But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his, what? Grace. Was pleased to reveal his son to me. And then he begins to talk about his life after his conversion. Stand firm by relying completely upon God's grace. Either today, you are either relying upon yourself or you are relying upon God's grace. And if you fit into the category that Martin Luther fit into or you are trying to rely upon Jesus and yourself, well, you're in the category of relying only on yourself. Because remember, it's either all Jesus or none of Jesus. Three things I want you to see verses five through six. Have faith that the Spirit of God will finish what he started. What kind of faith do we need? Well, we need to have faith that God will finish what he started, and he does that through the Spirit. Verse five, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Paul's saying we don't work for the hope of righteousness, we wait for the hope of righteousness. Doesn't mean that we sit back and we don't do anything with our lives as Christians. Again, Paul's going to say later in this chapter that we are to use our freedom to love one another and serve one another and do good works for the glory of God. But those things don't add to our salvation. They don't contribute to us being saved. We are saved 100% by the grace of God. And it is the Spirit of God that finishes what He has started. Let's see. What's today's date? 17th. Today's the 17th. So Wednesday would be the 20th. Tuesday. Wednesday. Yes. Wednesday is the 20th. On Wednesday, um, that will mark 22 years uh, from the time that I've trusted Christ as my Lord and Savior. I was thinking about that this morning. It was on my dad's birthday, and my dad was the one that led me to faith in Christ. And uh, his, his, his physical birthday, my spiritual birthday, June 20th. Uh, on that day, when I realized that I was a sinner, And there was nothing that I could do to ever earn God's love. But that he loved me anyway. And he paid the price for my sin by sending his son, Jesus, to die on the cross. And when he died on the cross, he was paying the price for my sin. And on that day when I trusted Jesus, I didn't understand a a whole lot about the Bible. But I understood that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. And Jesus was that Savior. 
And on that day, God began a work in me, a work of salvation. And do you know what? He will finish it. He has given us his spirit as a seal, Paul says in the book of Ephesians. He's given as a guarantee, a a down payment on our salvation. And when God puts a down payment on something, he's going to finish paying that off. He will. He's not going to default on that loan. Not God. He keeps his promises. God has promised to save me because I place my faith and trust in him. Not because I deserve it, but because he is so good and loving and gracious and because of what Jesus did on the cross. And so we have faith. We eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Looking forward to that day when one day I stand before God, deserving for him to send me to hell because I am a sinner and he is a righteous God. And then he will look at me and he will see the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he will judge me, not according to my sin, but he will judge me according to the righteousness of Jesus that he has freely clothed me with simply through my faith in him. And then I will be able to enter into his kingdom forever. All because of his grace. So we have faith that the Spirit of God will finish what he started in us. But we also have faith that Jesus is all that is necessary. This is just the flip side of what we said in verse 2. Verse 2, Paul says, If you try to add any works, Christ is not going to be of any advantage to you. So now in verse 6, he says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. What's he saying? Faith in Jesus is all that is necessary. That's it. Do you want to be saved? Place your faith in Jesus. There's nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else you have to do. It's not place your faith in Jesus and do this. It's just believe in Jesus. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. He's saying that trusting, that we must trust that nothing needs to be added to what Jesus has done. He's not saying that the physical act of circumcision is wrong. He's saying that the dependence upon that to make us acceptable to God is wrong. Listen to me, Christian. If you are in Christ Jesus, you have everything needed for salvation. And Paul has already told us that if you placed your faith in Jesus, you are saved. Remember last week, we can have confidence in our salvation. So if you're in Christ Jesus, you have everything needed for salvation. So the addition of something counts for nothing. If you already have everything, there's nothing more to add. John Wycliffe man who lived a little bit before Martin Luther, born a little bit before him, who fought for the same thing that Martin Luther fought for, a true understanding of the gospel. He gave his life, devoted his life to having translations of God's word that people could read, translations in their language that they could read so that they could read for themselves that the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church was wrong and that salvation was a free gift. You didn't have to do anything to add to it. He said this, All rules that are made to govern religious people add no more perfection to the gospel of Jesus Christ than does white color to a wall. Of course, he's referring to a wall that's already white. Saying, hey, here's a white wall. I'm going to add to it. White paint. Man, look at all that I'm adding to it. It's so much better now, isn't it? No? That was pointless. It was already white. Wycliffe's point is the same point Paul is making. We say, oh, I'm so thankful that Jesus died on the cross, but certainly I have to do something to kind of clean up my act if God's going to love me. Certainly God wouldn't just accept me and, and save me, even in my sin. So I need to add this and say no. As Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You say, well, does that matter how we live? No, it does. It does. Notice the last phrase. This is the last truth. We're to have a faith that works, not faith in works. And Paul's going to use this to launch into what he's going to say later in the letter, so I'm not going to spend much time on it, but notice that last phrase. What does count? If circumcision doesn't count, uncircumcision doesn't count, 
any kind of good works. It doesn't, those things don't add to our salvation. What does count? Faith working through love. Notice that phrase. We'll probably talk about it in a couple of weeks. Faith working through love. Now, as Paul already turned around, he's talking about, he's about working for our salvation. No, 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 no. He's talking about a faith that works, not a faith in my works. Big difference there. It's the work of Jesus on the cross applied to our lives through the work of the Spirit, which then produces spiritual fruit, good works. Good works where we're not trying to earn our salvation or pay God back. But it's just the result of the transformation that God has wrought in our lives through his grace. So we stand firm on God's grace. We rely completely today. Today, if you're being tempted, if you're being tempted, Christian, to think that your good works are somehow adding to your salvation, what God wants you to do is to fall back into his grace and say, I'm sorry, Lord, for thinking that I could ever add anything to what Jesus did on the cross for me. Can I talk to the men for just a minute? Ladies, you keep listening, okay? But I want to I talk to the men for just a minute. We like to stand firm on all sorts of things. We do. We do. And we stand firm on our favorite sports team. I mean, we'll argue up and down. Our team is the best, right? I mean, Clemson is the best. Are there other teams? Okay. Just, I guess not. Um, nobody threw anything at me. Um, never mind. I was going to make a, another bad comment, but I'm not going to do that. I'll be nice. I'll be nice to all the fans of that other team in South Carolina. Um, but we stand firm. We stand firm on our we'll, – we will argue up and down about who, who's, who's got the best quarterback or who's going to be the best. We'll, we stand firm on our favorite type of vehicle, right? Man, if you're a Ford man, you're a Ford man. If you're a Chevy man, you're a Chevy man, right? And we make jokes about the other one, right? We've got all kind of acronyms for, for Fords. I don't know about the acronyms for Chevys, but there's still jokes out there, right? Um, and so, so you, you're one or the other, right? You're Ford man, you're Chevy. We stand firm on that. We'll argue about it. We stand firm on our favorite way to fish, right? I mean, some, some of you, I call some names here, but I'm not going to because I might get them mixed up and I don't want to offend you. I mean, some, some of you guys, I mean, you're going to throw a Carolina rig and it don't matter if they're not biting it. You're going to throw a Carolina rig until your hands are, are, are tired and, and, and you can't cast another, another time. Or some of you, you're going you're gonna to throw that Texas rig and you're going to throw it and you're going to throw it and you're going to argue up and down that, that that's the way. You're going to stand firm on it, right? That's your way of fishing and, and that's the way it's going to be. When, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I loved four-wheelers and dirt bikes and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I, had a, I had an uncle that, uh, that owned a Yamaha dealership. And so, so you, I don't care. You could have paid me a million dollars, and I would not have said that any other brand of ATV was better than a Yamaha. I can remember sitting at the lunch table when I was a kid and arguing with one of my friends. I mean, how, how dumb is this? But I was arguing with him. He had a Polaris, and I had a Yamaha, and I sat there all lunch, multiple lunches, okay? I mean, this went on for I don't know how many weeks, and we would argue about which one was the best, and I stood firm on my ground. I said, I don't care how big that mud hole is that your Polaris went through, my Yamaha will go through it even better, even faster, right? I mean, I stood firm on it. We stand firm on all sorts of things, and let me tell you something again. All of us, but men... It's high time we start taking a stand on what matters most, the truth of the gospel, a gospel that's under attack. It always has been under attack by the enemy, and it always will be under attack by the enemy because he hates it. He hates that God would give us a free gift of salvation. He hates that God is that good and that loving and that powerful. And so he will attack it, and we must stand firm all of us, but men, God has called us for the sake of our wives and our kids and our church and our communities, our co-workers who need to know the truth about the gospel. He's called us to lead the way in that. 
I'm not saying it's wrong to stand firm or if you like a Chevy or a Ford or if you, if you like a Carolina rig or a Texas rig when you go fishing, stand firm on those things. Go ahead and argue about them, all right? We're going to take the time to do that. Why wouldn't we take the time to stand up for the gospel? Say, well, how do I do that? One of the best things, fathers, that you can do for your children is to teach them the truth about salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. Because I can tell you what, the world's not going to tell them that. Let them see you stand firm. And you're flipping through the TV channels and there's a preacher on there because there's a whole lot of them that preach works-based salvation. You stop and you say, you hear what he's saying? That's wrong because that's not what the Bible says. He's saying you've got to do this or do that in order to be saved. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we don't have to do anything for God to love us. He's already loved us through the person and work of His Son, Jesus Christ. Here's Paul's warning. If you attempt to be righteous through law-keeping, you reject Jesus, you reject grace, and you reject the Spirit. However, if you place your faith in Jesus, resting in the saving grace of God displayed through Christ's finished work on the cross... You will be free. Guess what? Paul didn't come up with this on his own. It's the very same, same thing that Jesus Christ himself said. John chapter 8, verse 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. A few verses later, he said, Jesus said, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So how do you stand firm? Stand in the grace of God. That is where true freedom is found. Martin Luther, after years and years of trying to earn his way to God, he finally understood that the only way he could be righteous in God's sight was if he was clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. So he placed his faith in Jesus Christ alone, and when he did, he experienced true freedom. And for the rest of his life, it changed who he was. For the rest of his life, he stood firm on the truth of the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. He stood firm in the face of criticism. He stood firm in the face of persecution. He stood firm in the face of his life being threatened. And if you asked him, if you were able to ask him where his resilience came from, I don't think he would say to you, well, it's because I'm so strong. It's because I'm so good at standing firm. No. I think he would quote to you a line from the hymn that he wrote. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. You know what he meant when he wrote that? The grace of God is strong enough to save us and keep us saved to the very end. And it is only as we rely upon that grace that firm foundation of God's grace and His grace alone, the work of Jesus and the work of Jesus alone, that we will be able to stand firm in Him. We stand firm in freedom because God's grace keeps us standing firm in freedom. All glory, all glory to God alone. Heavenly Father, thank You for our time in Your Word. Father, thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ. Father, there's someone here who is living a life of slavery because they're trying to earn their salvation. Father, I pray that today you would convict them that they are on a, a hopeless road, a road of slavery, a road that leads to utter destruction because we can never save ourselves. Father, I pray they would realize that you have given us all the grace we would ever need in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for those of us who are believers that we would daily rely 100% upon the work of Christ. That we would never look to our own works as adding to our salvation, only as evidence that we have been saved by your grace. Father, thank you for grace. Thank you for freedom. We give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.